Kelsey, this is my channel, The Fancy Hat Lady Reads. I'm wearing one of my fancy booktube hats, and today I'm bringing you a bit of a wrap-up slash analysis of five books that I read over the past year, um, none of which I've actually wrapped up yet because I have been terrible about wrap-ups for the past year, um, that were all nominees for the Hugo Award for Best Novel this year. I'm not claiming this is like a wrap-up of all of the Best Novel Hugo nominees because I chose not to read one of this year's nominees, The Light Brigade by Cameron Hurley, because I just didn't think it was going to be my thing. I didn't think I'd enjoy it. But the rest of the books in question that I want to talk about a bit today are in the order I read them. The Ten Thousand Doors of January by Alex E. Harrow, The City in the Middle of the Night by Charlie Jane Anders, Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir, A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin, and Middle Game by Seanan McGuire. Now you may notice something about this list if you know that I was also reading books for the Booktube SFF Awards this year. The Ten Thousand Doors of January, Gideon the Ninth, and A Memory Called Empire were also the three books that were on the short list for Best Debut Novel for the Booktube SFF Awards this year. And more than that, A Memory Called Empire and Gideon the Ninth uh, were the two of the three books from the Booktube SFF Awards Adult Science Fiction category that I was planning on reading. I opted not to read the Blake Crouch book that was Recursion. Again, for the same reason I chose not to read The Light Brigade for the Hugos, I just didn't think it was gonna be my thing. So this video is also going to serve as a wrap-up and discussion video for those two categories within the Booktube SFF Awards. So I fear that as a wrap-up for the books that I read like way back last year, this is going to be a little bit underwhelming. However, I have talked about these books in other contexts on this channel before, so if you've been watching my videos, my thoughts on these books shouldn't be a huge surprise. I also want to give what's a bit of a rote disclaimer at this point, that my reading for the past like year and a half and my opinions about books has been deeply, deeply skewed by my own like emotional state for the last year and a half. I have not been able to be as objective or critical about a lot of my reading as I like to be when I wrap books up and talk about them to you. And my feelings when I try to actually like rank these books for award purposes is really complicated for me because of that. And also because with this particular list of Hugo nominees especially, like there was a lot of apples and oranges going on in here. These books are not extremely directly comparable to each other. It was a really varied slate in terms of, you know, type of genre, fiction, style of writing, all of that. So all of that said, I am going to start with The Ten Thousand Doors of January, which is the book that I personally liked the most when I read it, and the book for which I have the most reservations about gushing about it to you uh, this late after I've read it. I obviously had an ARC copy of this from Book Expo. It was one of my most anticipated releases of the fall when it came out in September of last year. I read it right away before I saw anyone else's reviews of it, and I loved it in a very specific way where it hit a lot of sort of comforting and predictable emotional notes for me. Now I've become aware since then that there are some readers, especially uh, readers of color, who don't particularly like some of the POC representation in this. I've particularly seen some well-articulated thoughts of this from Mari from My Name is Marinez, and I wonder if I had seen some of those critiques first or if I had read this in less of a comfort reading mood, I might have felt differently about it. But given that I did love this when I read it, I do want to talk about what it is that I did love. This is a historical fantasy novel about a girl named January, and it is a portal fantasy in the sense that the magic in this world, the magic system as it were, uh, revolves around portals to other worlds, plural. It is not really a portal fantasy in the traditional sense, the where it involves a character like going into a specific world and like having a whole adventure there. This mostly takes place in our world. It does have a good deal in common with The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern, which I also adored and loved. Even more so, I think, because The Starless Sea is somehow both weirder and like more cozy, which 
I do not know how that works, but it does. This is more of a straightforward coming-of-age story that hits a lot of the, the story beats that you would expect of a coming-of-age story. But one of the things that this book has in common with The Starless Sea is that it features a protagonist who, as a child, uh, discovers a door to another world but does not end up going through it uh, on a portal adventure. Instead, January's door disappears, and like The Starless Sea, this book also features a sort of villainous secret society of people who believe the best thing for the world is to close all the magic door portals. January has been raised mostly by a man named Mr. Locke, who is not her father, he is her father's employer. Mr. Locke is super wealthy and involved in archaeology, um, and at this point in history, in this so sort of social context, archaeology means like going to other countries and stealing their stuff, which is correctly portrayed as not a good thing. But this is what Mr. Locke employs January's father to do for him, to go on these expeditions. And so January has ended up with this very privileged but like also seriously messed up upbringing, in part because she is non-white in a way that doesn't make sense uh, for the sort of upper-class society people um, with whom Mr. Locke mingles. This is also, like The Starless Sea, a book with, like, a book within a book, which is something I personally absolutely love. I love, I love me some stories within stories. The book within a book that January is reading throughout this story is one that she finds, that she believes has been left for her as a gift. It is a story seemingly written by a scholar from another world about a girl from our world named Adelaide, with whom January seems to have a great deal in common even though they're very different personalities. Adelaide is a farm girl who also discovers the existence of doors, and if you're like me you will figure out how this story connects to January's, like, long before January does. I didn't care. I didn't mind that I figured it out and I knew where, what the reveal was going to be long before it happened. Because, as I said, I found some of this book very comforting uh, because of its very predictable, emotional arc. A number of small things I also liked about this book. I liked that um, the portal world that we spend the most time learning about has magic that is uh, based on the written word and the way that weaves into the story I really enjoyed. I also really liked the father-daughter relationship between January and her actual father. It's obviously a very damaged relationship because uh, her father has made a lot of serious mistakes, especially in, you know, choosing to let January be raised by Mr. Locke. But I think her father's failings are shown in a very sympathetic light that show this relationship as, like, not beyond repair, and I really like how that sort of difficult but also hopeful. January also has a dog in this book, and the plot with the dog I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. I think it is sort of very directly derived from the plot with the dog in Deerskin by Robin McKinley. And I didn't like it as much because, like, nothing will be Robin McKinley for me, but I enjoyed the reference. I should tell you that even though there is a scare, the dog does not die. And that was another thing that I found, like, both maybe not technically good about the writing, but also comforting for me as a reader who, who needed a comfort read was that a lot of bad, bad things almost happen in this book, um, or like you think someone has died, but like it's actually okay in the end. And this happens enough times that like if you wanted to dump on this book for that I would not judge you. Um, but I also, I also enjoyed that sort of feeling that like everything, everything is going to be okay in the end because I needed that when I read this. So that's The Ten Thousand Doors of January. Next is the book that I probably remember the least, even though I, I know I liked it. And I was actually flipping through this book last night in advance of filming this video, like, what was in this book? What should I remember about this book that I have to talk about? And I feel like there's a lot in this book, and I remember very little about it. Um, that's The City in the Middle of the Night by Charlie Jane Anders. I also feel kind of weird about this because I read this before much of anyone else I knew had read it, and I liked it quite a lot, and then I feel like Everyone else I've seen on booktube who's read it since then has not liked this book 
at all. And I do wish I remembered it well enough to like defend my position and my like for this book. It is extremely different from All the Birds in the Sky, which was Anders's previous novel. So I think if you were going into this looking for something like that, um, you were going to be disappointed. I also saw when this was released comparisons to Ursula K. Le Guin's writing in a lot of the hype from authors and publishing people who had read it early, and I also think that might set you up for the wrong sort of expectations because I don't feel that this is a lot like the experience of reading Le Guin. What this is, is I think this is directly in conversation with some of the ideas and settings from The Left Hand of Darkness, which I also haven't read recently enough to talk about these two books the ways they're in conversation in any great detail. But certainly you get this whole setting with this inhospitable planet with two separate governments that are both sort of dystopian in their own ways, and I think that's directly derived from Left Hand of Darkness. Also like the whole journeys across vast swaths of inhospitable planet thing. But I think that's where the Le Guin comparisons are coming from more than uh, this being actually like reading Le Guin. This takes place on a planet that has been colonized by humans that does not have a day and night cycle, so it is always way too hot for habitability on the daytime side and way too cold for habitability on the nighttime side, and the only habitable bit for humans is this very narrow little stretch around the circumference. This book switches between the point of view of two different characters. The first, who I really think is the protagonist of the book, is Sophie. She comes from a city called Zeosphant. I don't know if I'm saying that right, um, but that is the first sort of primary setting that we get used to in this book, and Zeosphant has this extremely uh, restrictive society. Awake time and sleep time is regulated by a, a strict curfew. Work is strictly enforced. Um, everything is pretty tightly controlled by the government and the police. And Sophie is a college student from a sort of less privileged economic background who is unrequitedly in love with her roommate, Bianca. And Bianca comes from a much more privileged social background, and they're sort of involved in this rebellious student group. And this is where my memory of the details is getting all foggy, but I think what happens that sort of kicks this story off is that uh, Sophie takes the fall for something that Bianca did, and um, because Sophie is not rich or privileged, she is punished far more severely from it, and she's exiled, thrown out onto the cold side of the planet, which is essentially supposed to be a death sentence, except she doesn't die. She does not die because she encounters an alien creature um, who is from the native species on the planet that live on the, the cold side of the planet that the humans think are basically animals and monsters, um, and they hunt them. What Sophie discovers is that these creatures are actually a sapient intelligent species, and one of them rescues her, and she develops a relationship with them over the course of the book, and they end up, you know, wanting her help. The title city of the book, The City in the Middle of the Night, is neither of the two major human civilizations that are explored in this novel. It is the city that belongs to the species that uh, Sophie decides to call the Galette, or Gelet, G-E-L-E-T. That's what she calls them. There is not as much, like, overt discussion of gender in this book as there is in The Left Hand of Darkness. Um, the Left Hand of Darkness is mostly, I think, remembered for its discussions of gender, even though that's the part of the book that I think hasn't aged as well. I remember being much more struck by the politics of that book um, than the sort of outdated discussion of non-binary gender. But there are queer characters like Sophie in this novel, and I think the one real nod to uh, the left hand of darkness is gender a discussion is the this alien species which do not have gender and like the protagonist of Left Hand of Darkness sort of decides that 
all of the people on this planet, he's gonna use he, him pronouns for them, even though they, they don't, they aren't men. Sophie sort of decides that she's going to just use she, her pronouns for all of these aliens, but that's not a huge part of the story here. The other point of view character is a woman named Mouth, who comes from a, a tribe of a nomadic culture that has been wiped out, and she's now working with a band of, I think they're, they're smugglers, not just merchants, but, but don't quote me on that, who are traveling between these two cities. Uh, these two human cities, Zeosphant and Argolo. And when you start out this story with Zeosphant's political terribleness and, you know, terror upon its citizens, um, Argolo is sort of painted as this beacon of hope where people are free. And then by the time our main characters actually make it to Argolo, we see that it's actually full of all sorts of corruption and it's also terrible just in a very different way. But Mouth certainly does not start off as a particularly likable character. In fact, she isn't really likable at all for most of the book. She is justifiably deeply bitter about her entire people being wiped out, um, but she's also completely incapable of like moving on from that and having healthy relationships with the people who are in her life now. And it, it makes her very, very frustrating to read. I do think that's intentional, though, because I think all of the characters in this book um, go through phases where you don't really like them. This isn't a book that you read to fall in love with all of the people. It's a book where I think while I was reading it, I ended up feeling sort of betrayed several times by characters who I thought I liked who ended up doing something kind of shitty, or characters I was not predisposed to like who I ended up having to sort of grudgingly accept. And I think the writing of this book is doing that on purpose. It's throwing curveballs at you with your, you know, preconceived notions about all of the characters. These are all messy, messy people. The writing style of this book is certainly nowhere near as, like, quirky and weird as Charlie Jane Anders can be, as in with All the Birds in the Sky. Um, it is often pretty eloquent, though, and sort of sharp and cutting. During the virtual world con that happened, I attended a virtual reading where Charlie Jane Anders read essentially like a, um, a slam poem made of entirely of a bunch of different quotes from this book. And I was sort of like, whoa, I have, I have no memory of like three quarters of these lines, but they're all very good quotes. So I liked this book, but I had to do a lot of flipping through it to be able to like talk about it to you because it didn't, it didn't stick with me a ton. And I don't find myself thinking back on it much, but I did find it to be you know, thought-provoking and interesting when I read it, which is sometimes just what I want science fiction to do. I gave this four stars when I read it. I think I forgot to mention the star rating that I gave to 10,000 Doors of January, but this uh, was a five-star read for me. So those I both read in September of last year, so that's like coming up on an entire year. Um, the next book I read was Gideon the Ninth, which I read in October of last year. This was another arc from Book Expo, and I have to say this is not a book I would have even read except for like all of the peer pressure. This book was so hyped that there was kind of no way to avoid reading it, um, even though I was not particularly interested in, you know, the necromancy in space. I was not hotly anticipating a book full of bones. I did think, and I was correct in thinking this, that this was going to be pretty readable for me. It's a weird book. It is genre blending um, and a little stylistically odd in, in ways that aren't typical of you know, science fiction and fantasy being published right now. But it's not dense, it's pretty readable, um, and it is pretty action-packed and fast-paced. I think some people found the beginning parts of this book, like before the main characters get to the planet where the main plot happens, I think some people found that quite slow. I actually didn't find that slow at all. That was just like sort of normal paced book and then, and then it just got really fast because I think I have a different barometer for what slow versus fast paced is than I think a lot of people who uh, read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. This also was not as deeply, deeply spooky or scary as I was afraid it would be. The like tons of massive skeleton constructs 
um, were not actually that scary for me to read about, in part because they are just like skeleton constructs made of bone. They're not like actual dead people with flesh rotting off. That said, there were a number of ways in which I felt that this book was just not quite for me. I have said before on this channel that I do think this book is more fantasy than science fiction, and that could change as the series goes on. In fact, I expect it will. I expect we'll get more space opera from this series as it goes on. But this book really does take place entirely on first one planet, than another planet with like very little actual space travel stuff happening between there. And the plot focuses almost entirely on uh, the magic system of necromancy, which is 100% fantasy. It is kind of interesting because the main point of view character of this book, Gideon, is not a necromancer. She is a swordswoman. Um, she does not understand Harrow's necromancy and is sort of relaying it to us as an observer. So that's an interesting perspective and one that we will presumably see shift in book two because book two is about Harrow. But gosh, how do I even talk about this one? Because I feel like everyone who wanted to read this book has, has already read it and so I don't know who I'm really talking to here. Perhaps I am talking to the people like me in the audience who looked at this and thought, ah, this is probably not for me, um, but are hearing all of this hype and wondering, should I pick it up anyways? So here's what this is about. This takes place in a solar system uh, where all of the planets have, like, different houses that rule them, all in service of the undying god emperor, which, like, in the context of a world where all of the magic is based on different types of necromancy, I'm getting very ominous vibes from Undying God Emperor. I know that the sequel is already out, it just came out, people have read it, I might be totally wrong in my predictions, and if I am wrong people will know already, but I'm just going to say that if the Undying God Emperor turned out to be evil in book two, like it would be the least surprising twist since learning that the Darkling was the villain of the Grisha trilogy. But anyways, the main characters of this story come from the ninth house on the ninth planet, which is desolate and far from the sun and dark and gloomy, and it's super, super spooky and all about bones, and their job is to guard the locked tomb that must never be opened. Like, super ominous and dreary, this ninth house. Gideon, who likes swords and is good in a fight, um, for obvious reasons, really doesn't like it there and wants to escape, and she has this very contentious relationship with the house's heir. Harrowhark, um, who is, is Harrow. And I know a lot of people love the relationship between these two characters, like people all over the internet are like, Gideon and Harrow, I know, I know, I know. I did not, I did not like the, the relationship, the dynamic between them. It, I, I was uncomfortable with it. They are, for mysterious reasons that won't get explained until way later in the book, the only two young people of like any young generation on this entire planet. Um, and that's a plot thing that was like so obviously a reveal waiting to happen because there's so obviously some big reason behind this and if you're not telling us at the beginning then it's clear that you're saving it for a plot twist and like I can I can see where that plot twist is because you didn't give me this information at the beginning and I spent a good deal of the book just waiting for it. Um, so I feel like that wasn't a very well-constructed plot twist. But regardless, these two are the only young people on this entire planet and they hate each other. Harrow has all the power, Gideon has none of it. Harrow is effectively the de facto ruler of the Ninth House, but only a few people know that she is essentially ruling in her parents' stead and that her parents are actually dead. It's this big hush-hush secret. The whole ninth house is sort of on the verge of extinction. It's not a good time. However, these two, they hate each other so much and Harrow has all of the power in this relationship as the de facto ruler of the ninth house and Gideon is a total nobody. And they are just so viciously mean to each other at the beginning of the book. And Harrow especially is so cruel to Gideon as the person in this relationship who has all the power. And I know there are big reveals and big shifts in the dynamic between these two that you're supposed to feel things about by the end of the book, but ultimately I couldn't, I couldn't come around to forgiving Harrow for being that cruel. Like it was too much. It was so over the top in the beginning parts of this book that like that redemption 
story mending of the relationship was really there was not enough there for me to be happy with it. But anyways, I sort of lied when I said they were the two only young people on this entire planet. There's there's a third who does not last long, and because he dies, um, Gideon has to step up to become Harrow's Cavalier, which is her swordswoman. Specifically, she has to learn how to use a very different sort of courtly sword technique um, instead of the big heavy broadsword that she likes to smash things with, and she has to do this fast and convincingly because the Emperor has summoned the heirs of all of the houses and their cavaliers to uh, this competition, possibly? At least a lot of them treat it like a competition, whether it is or not, um, to become uh, the Emperor's new lictors, which are like his right hand people. And so all of the heirs and their cavaliers are summoned to this planet with this old, abandoned, creepy palace where they're going to live and they have no idea exactly what it is they're supposed to do, but they end up stumbling across all of these like necromancy puzzles that they have to solve. And then the murders start happening. So it's like both competition, necromancy, magic system, puzzle solving, and also like murder mystery, why is everyone dying? And that's basically what the meat of the book is. The other thing that I did not like about the book that sat uncomfortably with me was all the murders. Like I wasn't that, um, that squicked by any of the necromancy, all of the, the different houses sort of have all of their different specialties and types of necromancy, so it's like, everything is necromancy, everything is death magic, but like it's all different types of death magic, and like, Harrow is the one who can make all of these bone constructs from just like a little sliver of bone, but like, everyone from all the different houses has like different abilities. If you're really into like weird intricate magic system stuff, this, this will be something you might enjoy. But the murders are, um, especially sort of disturbing, or at least I found them so. And I think this is one of those things where it might just be that there there is some actually good writing here, where like when a character dies it's supposed to be upsetting in the book. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I did find some of the deaths genuinely upsetting in terms of like who died and how they died. But it was upsetting in a way that I'm, I think it it's just me being very sensitive to this sort of thing. I think a lot of people who read this book just enjoy the puzzle of the murder mystery and like aren't that deeply affected by the actual murders, but I am. But again, the style of the book is is fun, it's different, it's interesting. Um, the There's a lot of very like modern contemporary humor in it um, that I think some people really, really enjoy, some people bounce hard off of it. I was kind of in the middle. I sort of appreciate it as a, a different sort of flavor of, you know, science fantasy pop culture world building. Interestingly, Tamsin Muir is from New Zealand, and again, at Virtual World Con, I attended some panels that uh, pointed out that there is a sort of very New Zealand flavor to some of the very contemporary humor in this book, which I was never going to pick up on, but that's interesting to make note of. All in all, I gave this three stars. I, I did find it readable, I did enjoy bits of it. Will I read book two? I've been hearing that Harrow the Ninth is very, very different from this book in some ways that really, really intrigue me. So I would have said before I heard much about from people who had read Harrow that like, no, I don't think I'll continue with this series. However, my interest is piqued again, again, by all the hype. Is this a series that I'm just going to be dragged into reading all three books just by the hype? Maybe we'll see if I end up reading Harrow or not. I'm really on the edge. I realize that I think I forgot to switch my face out at the beginning of this video. There, it's switched. Um, the next book I have to talk about is A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin, which of course won the Hugo Award for Best Novel this year. I do think that was deserved. This is a science fiction novel of space politics and court intrigue. It is all about cultural imperialism. The main character of this is a young woman named Mahit, who is from a small independent nation of basically asteroid miners. They um, live in a 
solar system without habitable planets, so they are a space station based uh, culture. And they have, until this point, managed to maintain their independence from the gigantic, looming Texacalanli Empire. At the beginning of the book, Mahit has been selected to uh, become the new ambassador from her space station to the giant empire. And uh, this is a situation that is irregular and fraught for a number of reasons. First of all, because no one knows what actually happened to the prior ambassador, Iskander. The Texacolomli Empire has just said we need you to send a new ambassador without any further explanation. And the other major irregularity has to do with this technology that Mahit's people have called an imago machine that is basically a way of preserving memories from generation to generation. It is traditional for someone assuming a professional role to receive an imago that was, you know, harvested from their predecessor. It basically contains a copy of all of that person's knowledge and memories and some of their personality and that eventually comes to fuse with the, uh, the recipient's personality, so they have all of this inherited knowledge that is really, really valuable in a very small society. The problem was that the only imago that they have of her predecessor Iskander is many years out of date and doesn't know anything about the current situation in the Empire. And then once she gets there, she discovers that one, Iskander is dead and it looks like he might have been murdered, so there's a whole mystery to untangle. Two, her imago that she does have starts failing, again for unknown reasons, and furthermore she begins to realize that a number of very critical people in the Empire at court seem to actually know about her people's imago machines and what they can do when this is absolutely supposed to be a, you know, state secret that the Empire is not supposed to know about. Now I said that I think the main theme of this book is cultural imperialism. You have as the main character Mahit who has studied the culture and the language of the Empire her whole life and is deeply, deeply infatuated with it, enough to have, you know, wanted to pursue this area of study to the extent that she can be sent to the Empire as an ambassador and be expected to, you know, actually exist and do politics within their political system and their court. And we see all of the reasons why Mahit has become so infatuated with the culture of the Empire. It is rich in poetry, in architecture, in art, and all of that is woven into every aspect of how the Empire presents itself and how people in high society interact with each other. There is so much poetry, like so much poetry, and like everything has in references to all the poetry. And what Mahit is really grappling with in the whole book is how that presentation and that culture of the Empire is meant to impress her, to awe her, to make her want to love it, but also to constantly other her and prevent her from ever being able to actually assimilate, ever being able to actually be a part of it because she wasn't raised in it. And this is also kind of the main thread of the central character relationships in this book. Um, Mahit gets to the Empire's home planet um, and discovers that she basically can't do anything, like anything, without the assistance of her cultural liaison, who's a woman named Three Seagrass. All of the Texacolomly names are like this, they are like number, noun, it's very interesting. But basically Mahit doesn't have her like own equivalent of like internet access without Three Seagrass doing it for her because she's not a citizen. There's this whole thing about how Three Seagrass is supposed to be there to open doors for her which is sort of metaphorical but also sort of literal because a lot of physical doors literally won't open if you're not keyed into like the internet. And if you love like super competent hyper intelligent characters I think you will really love Three Seagrass because that is exactly what she is. Um, she doesn't understand Mahit's frustration at being othered this way though, because she is so entrenched in the ideology of the Empire that she cannot quite fathom what it would be like to have one's own culture that is not the Empire that might have some actual value. But Mahit is in a situation of 
kind of needing to actually be able to trust Three Seagrass and not knowing if she really can because Three Seagrass is of course working for the Empire and Mahit's job, like her one real job is to make sure that, you know, the Empire actually doesn't invade and take over her mining colony, like they want to maintain their independence. But the point is that Mahit um, ends up reluctantly trusting Three Seagrass and this relationship between the two of them is wonderful um, but prickly. It does turn romancy by the end. And then there ends up being a sort of third character in this group who gets kind of looped in to all of the intrigue and shenanigans that um, Mahit and Three Seagrass are increasingly getting more and more entrenched in because Twelve Azalea is a good friend of Three Seagrass's and so he kind of gets towed along for the ride. I feel like there are a lot of interesting threads and elements to this story that I won't be able to touch on all of them even in the slightest in a wrap-up. I think part of what made this so fun for me to read was just how smart all the characters are. I talked about this a little bit uh, when I wrapped up The Priory of the Orange Tree because I read this book and that one back to back and they're both books with a lot of court politics and intrigue. Um, and there's this stark difference for me between books where, like, the conflict happens because none of the characters are willing to put aside their biases for long enough to, like, realize that they can work together for a common cause. And that's just very frustrating for me, and that was Priory of the Orange Tree. This is what I sort of said was the, the opposite of that for me, where court politics and intrigue really works for me because it's all about very, very smart people who are constantly outwitting each other or matching wits in very satisfying ways. This may be a little bit less realistic. I will certainly never be as smart as either Mahit or Three Seagrass or any of the people in positions of great power in the Empire whom they end up matching wits with. I do find some satisfying wish fulfillment, though, in reading about characters who are in fact this smart. So that is a memory called Empire. It is good stuff. I gave it four stars. I don't think it's a super revolutionary novel in any way. If you can imagine space empire political intrigue with lots of super smart characters doing super smart things, then you've probably got a good idea of what to expect from this. But it is executed extremely well. It has some good concepts and ideas behind it. It's a smart book and it is very elegantly written. I do plan on reading the sequel, A Desolation called Peace when it comes out next year. I will tell you that this does pretty much work as a standalone though. Um, the story within this book it pretty much gets wrapped up, although there are clearly some open-ended uh, possibilities for where this could go in the future. But it's not the sort of first book in a series that will leave you mad that it ended in the middle of something. And then the last book I have to talk about is Middle Game by Seanan McGuire which I read an ebook copy of that was in the Hugo Voter Packet. This is one that I was only going to read if it ended up nominated for awards. It did. I read it. And I had super conflicted feelings about it. There were aspects of this book that I was really genuinely invested in, that I, I really genuinely loved, that got under my skin. There were also parts of it that got under my skin in the wrong way and made me very upset. Set. So I gave this a three star rating, but it's not like a middle of the road meh three star rating. It's like an oh my god, I have such conflicted feelings three stars. I think this was a more extreme example of the dynamic with Sean and McGuire's writing that I also experienced when I read the first novella in the Wayward Children series, Every Heart a Doorway. And I'm guessing that this might just be uh, personal to me with how Sean and McGuire's writing hits me because I never saw like anyone else talk about having the same mixed bag of feelings with Every Heart a Doorway that I did. Um, but the dynamic at work here is that I care so much about the characters, but the things that are happening in the plot are so disturbing and I can't. Only this was like those feelings blown out to an extreme because this is like, uh, this is a very long novel. This is maybe like a 500 page novel. And that was like a tiny novella. 
So, like, I care even more about the characters, and I am even more disturbed by what's going on. This is also a super duper weird book that does some fun sort of structural narrative things that, um, would normally really, really intrigue me, um, because it is, it is experimenting with narrative structure to tell a story that ends up being twistier and weirder in its basic fundamental shape than you think it is. And that is something that I like, um, but I feel like some of that worked better for me in this book than other parts of it. Basically, this is a book about alchemy, so I categorize it firmly as a fantasy novel, even though there is, like, magical math and stuff and like kind of mad science levels of science. It's alchemy science, so it's magic. We are following a pair of alchemically engineered twins who were like created in a laboratory and separated at birth and adopted out to different families. Their names are Roger and Dodger. Roger is the boy and Dodger is the girl. And the whole deal here is this extremely disturbing situation where um, basically their creator is this essentially immortal creation of a uh, long-dead alchemist named Asphodel Baker, who also published children's portal fantasies under the name A. Deborah Baker, which are also part of her alchemy. So the evil mastermind who created Roger and Dodger is basically the immortal Frankenstein monster creation of Asphodel Baker. And what he is doing in his secret lab with his also immortal assistant um, is immoral and terrifying. They're like mass producing all of these children in a lab setting. They're like totally willing to kill off completely heartlessly if, if they stop being useful to them. And these children that they're creating are meant to be embodiments of alchemical principles and therefore they sort of have like alchemical superpowers. By the way, I think the whole backstory of this is that there's like a secret alchemical society in, in our world. I think it's like a secret society thing because um, there's all this history of alchemy but I, it's not something that like the regular people of the world know about. It is it, is, it does take place in our world. And basically, Roger and Dodger, we know from the beginning, this is not spoilers, we as the reader know this, they are created to be um, between the two of them, an embodiment of the entire alchemical doctrine of ethos, which basically means that between the two of them, when they come into their full powers, they will theoretically be able to control the entire universe. And what is super duper scary about this is that they have no clue about any of it, but of course the, their evil mastermind creator does, and his goal is to control them and, you know, make himself a god. So this is a terrifying plotline. There's a lot of senseless violence, a lot of cruelty, a lot of just like sort of really horrific stuff. And then you've got this absolutely engrossing double coming of age story about these two kids who grow into adults who are each struggling in like really re relatable ways with being unusual kids with being prodigies in their own ways um, and who have this psychic connection with each other even though they don't meet in person for a very long time and i really ended up just wanting to get lost in this story about them but it was super duper terrifying knowing and being occasionally reminded that this absolutely horrific stuff is looming over these innocent kids and they have no clue. So some things about our magical twins who are uh, seemingly living this sweet coming into magical powers storyline. Dodger is the math genius and being a girl who is very evidently a math prodigy is very hard on her. She doesn't really have friends, she doesn't make friends well, um, and she's becomes very emotionally dependent on this psychic connection that she has with Roger, who, despite being a literary and language prodigy, is able to live a much more well-adjusted normal life. And there are things that disrupt this relationship, and the ways that each of them, like, cope with that or fail to cope with that are just such good character studies that I really loved. I felt, I found myself so deeply invested in them, and I wished they were in a story where, like, their magical connection and their superpowers was going to be so nice and fulfilling for them instead of just this 
terrifying horror. I should mention a content warning for a suicide attempt that's a major plot point that was less disturbing for me than all of the creepy alchemy and casual murder stuff. Um, but your mileage may vary. It was also pretty clear to me that Dodger is intended to be an asexual character. I don't think it was ever explicitly stated, but given Sean and McGuire's history of ace rep in books, I think it's safe to assume that was the intent. And then the confusing way this story ends up working out is kind of, I think, supposed to be balanced between Dodger's magical math concepts and, like, Roger's magical language ability. Like, these are sort of supposed to be equal ways of describing the world and therefore controlling the world, was my, my loose understanding of how this alchemy works. But I was kind of surprised that for a book, you know, written by a fantasy author who obviously, like, cares a lot about storytelling and literary genre and all of that. There's even this whole story within the story of these books that A. Deborah Baker wrote um, that apparently describe her entire theory of alchemy in portal fantasy form. Like, we know Sean McGuire is really into portal fantasy sort of meta-genre stuff. Given all that, I was expecting Roger's whole literary side of things to make more sense than it did. It really didn't. Um, Dodger's math side, even though I'm sure none of the math is really real in the slightest because it's all magic math, like, her relationship with her abilities and the way she comes into those abilities and the way that's described as being meaningful within the story made a good deal more sense to me than Roger's whole literary side of things ever did and the whole portal fantasy metaphor. There was a part near the end where I was really expecting Roger to finally understand, like, all of the literary stuff with the portal fantasy over the Woodward Wall that's actually getting published as, like, the book within the book is being published as a middle grade novel, but that's a side tangent. But I was expecting Roger to finally have an epiphany and, like, understand the portal fantasy metaphors and then be able to sort of explain them to us, but he didn't. Like, this was supposed to be his thing. Anyways, I did read the whole book, I got to the end, and I was really glad that they survived their creepy, creepy coming-of-age experience. This is another one that works as a standalone. I think it would have been fine as a standalone. It doesn't need a sequel. I believe it is, however, getting a sequel. I don't think I'm going to be reading the sequel. And that's it. That's the end of all the books that were nominated for the Hugos this year. Those were the ones I read. Again, I did not read The Light Brigade. Um, so, I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite this year because last year when I was talking about all of the awards nominated books that I read I was really talking a lot about how I felt some of them were really innovative and pushing the genre in interesting directions and how those were my top choices because of that. Um, this year I felt like the more innovative books which I, I read that were Gideon the Ninth and Middle Game were the books I actually personally liked the least. For sort of similar reasons, these both had kind of disturbing elements that uh, made me a little upset, even though I felt like I was supposed to be just enjoying the ride of the story, and I had a hard time knowing how I was supposed to feel about that. These are also just generally, in, in terms of atmosphere and tone, darker and spookier books than I particularly like to read. And then my favorite two, these ones, were kind of the more predictable and formulaic. So this could be just my reading mood, or it could be just a coincidence with this batch of books. And then in the middle is The City in the Middle of the Night, which I feel is maybe a little more experimental than these two, but nowhere near as unusual and weird as Gideon the Ninth and Middle Game. This was also, in terms of this batch, the least memorable book for me, even though I really liked it. But I do feel like, to some extent, the entire purpose of my booktube channel has always been sort of at the core me wrestling on camera in public with what makes a book work for me and what doesn't, and I, I'm still wrestling with it. That's, that's my eternal struggle. I don't necessarily have any easy answers for you. And then just to recap, because I'm also ostensibly talking about the Booktube SFF Awards here, um, my preferences for the debut novel category are, are approximately in this order, and then here the two that were uh, nominees in the adult science fiction category. Anyhow, let me know if you've read any of these books, if you were reading for the Hugos or the Booktube SFF Awards or both, let me know what you think. Anyhow, I hope you're having a nice day. That is all. Bye for now.